we're going to be calculating how the United States calculates its entire output, the entire GDP, gross domestic product for the year, and the resulting national income that's earned in producing that level of GDP. All countries calculate their GDP. Here's just a list of what we'll be covering in this chapter. It's quite a lengthy chapter, but it's also very important. So the National Income Accounting measuring the economy's overall performance. It is the job of the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the United States to compile this information. As I said, we're going to use it to assess, assess the health of our economy and track our long run progress and where we want to go in the future. It also lets us compare from one country to another. Gross domestic product, so you need a definition. So let's talk about what is it. So gross domestic product is measured in terms of money, so it's a monetary measure of all the final goods and services, and we're gonna concentrate on that word final, the monetary measure of all the final goods and services produced within the nation, so produced here in the United States, over a given time period. So we're going to be Try making uh, an attempt to include the value, the monetary value of everything that gets produced in the nation. And we only want to count things one time. We want to avoid multiple counting. So when we calculate GDP, we are focused on final goods and services. So if you think about it, some of the things that are produced in the nation are parts and pieces of bigger things that are going to be produced and sold. And when that bigger item is sold, it includes the value of all the smaller parts and pieces that were included, for example. Think about Ford selling a truck, just their F-150 truck, just the usual Ford truck. Think about all the parts and pieces that go into that truck. For example, I have um, seen the glass facility in Oklahoma that just manufactures the glass that are going to go in different vehicles, not just Fords, but a lot of different vehicles and even some residential kinds of purposes. So if we count the value of that glass when it's sold to Ford, and then we count the truck when the truck is sold to Mr. Smith, then the value of that glass is getting double counted because we counted it when it sold, if we counted it, when we sold it to Ford and then we counted it again and the overall value of the truck, you wouldn't pay as much for a truck that didn't have any windshields in it or windows, right? So we're trying not to count the intermediate goods, the goods like the glass when it's sold to the Ford Motor Company. We don't count it then because it's an intermediate good. It's gonna be used in the production of another good. So we focus on counting the final goods and services. We want to focus on just the things that are produced in the United States. So in the calculations that are to come, you're going to see an account called net foreign factor income. And it accounts for people who are foreign nationals working here in the United States. Well, they're building stuff for the United States economy. And we want to count their work, even though they may be paying their taxes and reporting their income back to their home countries. We have Americans that are reporting their income back to the United States, but they're working in other countries and building up somebody else's economy. We don't want to count the value of their work because it's building up whatever host country that they're working in. So we're working hard to count just what's produced in the United States, to count just final goods, and to avoid multiple counting. So this just kind of gives us a really simplistic example. If we had a country that only made sofas and computers, that's all they made. And in year one, they made three sofas and each sofa um, sold for $500. And they made two computers and each computer sold for $2,000. Then when you add up the two computers and the three sofas, their GDP, their gross domestic product, would be $5,500 that, that year. In year two, they sold two sofas and three computers. 
The sofas are valued at 500 again and the computers at 2000. So there hasn't been any inflation or price changes. When we multiply that out, their total GDP is 7,000 in the second year. So ours is not nearly so simplistic, right? We make millions of goods and services. So it's a little bit harder for the Bureau of Economic Analysis to come up with this data. There are some things that are not included in GDP because they don't represent any current production. So remember, a GDP, the monetary value of all the final goods and services produced within the nation in a given time period. So we're generally talking about GDP for a certain year. So these things we need to concentrate on not counting in GDP. So we need a definition of what a transfer payment is. A transfer payment is money from the government to an individual or one individual to another for which the individual doesn't produce any good or service. So it's some sort of a gift or a grant um, that would be given to someone, but they don't actually produce anything. That's why it doesn't count in GDP. So a public transfer payment would be something like a welfare payment, an aid to families with dependent children, a rent assistance, food stamps, um, any sort of money from the government to an individual that the individual didn't have to produce or good or service uh, in, in response to that payment. It's broader than that. If you think about all social security payments from the government to an individual, veterans benefits, um, any sort of payment from the government to an individual that the individual doesn't have to produce a good or service back to the government right then during that time period is a transfer payment. And since it didn't produce any good or service, it doesn't get counted in GDP. Private transfer payments are things like uh, scholarships or just gifts inside of families, that sort of thing. So nothing's being produced, so that's not gonna get counted in GDP. Stock market transactions, same thing. Nothing is being produced. If I buy a share of stock in GM today, it gives me a part ownership of GM, but nothing was actually produced in the production of that share of stock. So stock market transactions do not count in GDP either. And then of course, nothing secondhand. So if I sell you my truck, then it, that truck was counted in the year that it was produced, and so it's already been counted. Just because I sell the truck from me to you doesn't mean that anything has been produced. So if you come to my garage sale and you buy all my wonderful stuff, I would be so appreciative, but none of that would count in GDP because nothing new had been produced. So there's two approaches to calculating GDP meaning there's two ways to do it, but you're going to get the same answer whether you do it by the income approach or by the expenditures approach. It's just two sides of the same coin, but the, the approach, the methodology of calculating it is different, but the answer you get will not be. So the income approach. The income approach calculates GDP, gross domestic product, that value of all the goods and services produced, by counting up all the income earned in the production of the goods and services. The expenditures approach calculates GDP by adding up all the money spent to purchase the goods and services. So some people earned income, wages, rent, interest, and profits in producing the GDP, and we're gonna count up all of that to calculate GDP or we can calculate the actual money spent to purchase the GDP. We're gonna get the same number, but it depends on what data we have, which approach we're going to use. So this just gives us an overall comparison of GDP by the expenditures approach but versus the income approach. This doesn't give us enough detail for us to actually use yet, but we can talk about it. So the expenditures approach on the left adds up all the GDP that was purchased by households. So you think about what households purchase. Um, might be computers and grocery store food and restaurant food and housing and clothes and that sort of thing. Everything we buy at Walmart. Uh, plus investment, remember investment was businesses spending money on capital equipment 
So don't think investment as stocks and bonds or anything like that. In economics, investment has a specific definition. It's everything that businesses need to produce their good or service that's not land, not natural resources, and not people. So when businesses buy capital equipment, then that goes in this investment expense. And then everything that government purchases, and then our net exports. So exports minus imports, that's our expenditures by foreigners. So we could add up GDP by the expenditures approach, or we could add up GDP by the income approach. Remember, income was all the money earned in producing the GDP. So wages was payment to labor, and rent was the payments to land, all those natural resources. Interest is the payment to capital, purchase of capital equipment. And profits was the payment to the entrepreneurial ability. And then there are some statistical adjustments, which will be You'll be using this example slide, this chart, to calculate GDP by the expenditures approach. So I'd like you to pay really close attention to it. This is real data from 2018, but more importantly, this is your example for calculating GDP by the expenditures approach. So this, half, this personal consumption expenditures, this is all, everything that is, um, all the money that is spent by households for whatever it is that households want to buy. I wish I was quicker to write, but I really want you to get the point. This is all the money spent by households. So what do we buy? We buy houses and cars and insurance policies and haircuts and whatever it is. This is all the money that consumers spend. Notice that it's denoted with a C. You're going to need the shortcut um, labeling later. So I want you to realize that personal consumption expenditures is the spending by households and we label that with a C. Consumers, money spending by people like you and me. You'll have data charts that give you this information. So you'll be looking for personal consumption expenditures, substituting that in for C in the formula. Then you're going to have gross private domestic investment. This is money spent by businesses, but remember investment was money that businesses spent on capital equipment, right? B-U-S-I. <laughs> N-E-S-S. -S. My shortcuts don't always work. So it's gross private domestic investment, not net. So I need you to remember that because sometimes in your data charts, you're not given gross. Sometimes in your data charts, you're given net. So if you have net investment, you're going to have to add net investment. I am really slow, aren't I? You're gonna have to add a category called Consumption, I'm going to abbreviate this, consumption of fixed capital, CFC, net investment plus consumption of fixed capital gives you gross investment. So that's a frequent student mistake. They don't have gross investment listed in their data chart, so they just pick up net investment thinking that's the same thing, and it's not. So if your data chart gives you net investment, look for consumption of fixed capital, add those two together to get your gross investment. So gross private domestic investment, private means it's not a government, it's all private businesses. Domestic meaning it's here in the United States. Investment is spending on capital equipment by businesses. Then government purchases. So government purchases is just that. Anything that the government purchases or um, for example, I worked for the Federal Aviation Administration and for the Army Corps of Engineers. When I was young, I, I worked for them, I provided a service for them, and they paid me. So what they paid me for providing that service gets counted as government purchases, but so does maybe you have family that work at Lockheed and the government has contracts with Lockheed to produce the various aircraft that they might need for wars or whatever. And so paying for those aircraft is government purchases. So you'll always have a line item in your data charts if you're going to use the expenditures approach of government purchases, and you'll just add that. And then net exports. But net exports is not always given. If net exports is not given, 
Remember that you can take your exports and subtract imports to get your net exports. So notice that all of this is added together. You're going to do your personal consumption expenditures. That'll be a line item on the data chart. Gross private domestic investment, that's a line item. If you don't see it, add net investment plus consumption of fixed capital to get gross and then net exports, which is exports minus imports. So when you have all of those data um, line items added together, you'll have gross domestic product by the expenditures approach. Or you'll have the data to do the income approach. So the income approach, compensation of employees, that's our wages, that's payment to labor. Rents, that's payment to those natural resources, land. Interest, payment to capital. And then profits are divided up into two categories. So business can, businesses can be owned as sole proprietorships or they can be owned as corporations. So a sole proprietorship is going to, the profits are gonna be reflected as proprietor's income. If it's a corporation, the profits will be reflected as corporate profits. Then what you have to do is look for in the taxes on production and imports account, add all that together, and you don't have GDP, you have national income. You have payment to all of your resources, labor, land, capital, two profit accounts, and then the taxes that we have to take into consideration. We paid those taxes in the expenditures approach, but it wouldn't show up here if we didn't have the separate line item. So you'll be looking at your data charts to find these items, add them together, you'll get national income. And then we have to make those statistical adjustments to actually get to GDP, gross domestic product. So once we have national income, we subtract out that net foreign factor income. That's what I was telling you that does the adjustment for foreign nationals working here or Americans working abroad so that we just count the GDP that was produced here in the United States. So notice that's the only time we see a subtraction. This less means subtract net foreign factor income. Then we're gonna add the consumption of fixed capital and add statistical discrepancy. All of those data accounts will be on your charts and that will give you the gross domestic product that we were looking for. This just gives you more information about each of those um, accounts. So on the expenditures approach, our first account was personal consumption expenditures. Remember that was households, that's what households buy. So households buy two kinds of goods and services. So we break down the two kinds of goods as durable and non-durable, and that just really talks about how long we expect the goods and services to last. So if we expect the good, or so, the good this would be a good that we bought, to last more than three years, then it's a durable good. If we expect it to last less than three years, it's a non-durable good. So when we buy houses, cars, refrigerators, we're thinking durable goods. When we buy um, food from the grocery store or any kind of thing you're, you're gonna use up, like cleaning products, that sort of thing, those would be non-durable goods. We would not expect them to last more than three years. And then services. Most of us spend a good deal of money on services in the United States. So think about all the services that you purchase. Uh, we get our hair cut, we go to get our nails done, we go to the doctor or the lawyer or a million others that aren't coming to my mind right at the moment. Restaurant service, um, we go to the movies, various in, in entertainment, those are all services. So. When, we, when the Bureau of Economic Analysis is calculating personal consumption expenditures, they're looking at all the ways that households spend their money. That second account in the expenditures approach was gross investment, gross investment, gross private domestic investment. 
Private just means it's not government. Domestic means here in the United States. And investment means businesses buying capital equipment. So we see this list of all the things that businesses could buy here. It's important that you realize that gross investment has two components. There is net investment, which is all the new stuff that businesses buy to expand their business or, or brand new businesses setting up for the first time. And then there's consumption of fixed capital, which is replacing the capital that we have purchased before, but that wore out. So gross has two components, consumption of capital and net investment. So this slide breaks that out. This gross investment, notice, is your net investment plus the depreciation, which in your book, the phrase is consumption of fixed capital. And that will give us the gross investment. So if we have a certain amount of capital stock on January 1st, so if you just think all over the nation, all the different capital equipment that all the businesses are using, Notice if on December 31st, it's larger amount of capital stock, then we must have had a positive net investment, meaning that businesses not only replaced everything that wore out, that depreciation called consumption of fixed capital, but they also added to their capital stock. So we had a positive net investment, and that gave us a greater amount of capital stock at the end of the year. And then we said the next third component of the expenditures approach was government purchases. So anything the government purchases that um, is a service or a good is counted in GDP. When I was young, I used to work for the Federal Aviation Administration and the Army Corps of Engineers. And so they would pay me for the work that I would do for them and that would be counted in GDP. I was actually rendering a service to the government and that would be counted. Some of your families maybe works at Lockheed and they have the big government contracts to produce the big aircraft and the government purchases those and that's counted in GDP. So all the goods and services that the government buys is counted as government purchases. We denote that with a capital G. And then that last component is net exports. So we want to count what's produced here in the United States and sold overseas and not count all of those imports that we have into the United States. So we need net exports, which is exports minus imports. So look at the bold letters down at the bottom. I really want you to um, concentrate on how to calculate. Let's see if I can get this pen here. I don't know if I can or not. Yep, I want you to con concentrate on how to calculate GDP by this formula, okay? So GDP by the expenditures approach is C plus IG plus G plus XN. C, personal consumption expenditures, spending by households. IG, the subscript G meaning gross investment, gross private domestic investment, plus G, government expenditures, plus XN, which is net exports. When I was taking this class, again, 100 years ago, my economics instructor told us not to greet her in the hallway with, hello, how are you? She said, greet her in the hallway with GDP equals C plus IG plus G plus XN, because it's so important to know. It helps the rest of the semester if you remember this formula for GDP. So this is just a global perspective. It looks at GDP and these different nations. It's calculated in terms of dollars so that we can compare, but we just look and see how really large the United States economy is as compared to other nations. Okay, so we reviewed the expenditures approach, C plus IG plus G plus XN. The income approach needs a little bit more explanation. So that's what we're doing here. So remember, we added compensation of employees, that was paying our labor. We added rent, that's payment to all natural resources. We added interest, payment to capital. We added our two profit sources from sole proprietorships and from corporations, proprietor's income, corporate profits. 
You will always have the corporate profit number given to you. You're not going to have to actually add the corporate income taxes, dividends, and undistributed corporate profits in order to calculate corporate profits. But you could. If you had these three categories, you could calculate corporate profits. But corporate profits will be given to you. And then taxes on production and imports. Do you remember what that equaled? Did that equal GDP? Nope, that equaled national income. So from national income to get to GDP, we need to make these adjustments. We need to subtract the net foreign factor income. Then we need to add statistical discrepancy and add the consumption of fixed capital. And then you'll get to GDP by the income. So now that we've got GDP by the income approach, we need to talk about, and the expenditures approach, we need to talk about some other national accounts. So frequently you'll be asked for net domestic product or national income or personal income or disposable income. So here's a wonderful chart that's gonna help you walk through each of those steps. So you had a chart that showed you how to calculate GDP by the expenditures approach. You had a chart that showed you how to calculate GDP by the income approach. And now you've got this wonderful chart to show you how to calculate all those other accounts. So this time you start with the big number, GDP. If you take GDP and you subtract out consumption of fixed capital, you get NDP, net domestic product. If you have net domestic product and you subtract out statistical discrepancy and add net foreign factor income, you'll get back to national income. So now you know two ways to get national income. You know that you could have added rent, interest, uh, compensation of employees, two kinds of profit and taxes on production and imports, that equaled national income. Or if the data you have looks more like this, you could get NDP, subtract out statistical discrepancy, add net foreign factor income, and now you would get back to your national income. If you had national income, look at the different accounts you could subtract out and then add transfer payments and you'd get to personal income. Now that's how much money households actually make. Then from personal income, we subtract out the personal taxes. You know, when you get your check, it has all those taxes subtracted from it. That's disposable income. That's how much money households actually have to spend. How much households actually have to spend is our disposable. <coughs> Remember when we looked at the circular flow model at the end of chapter two with businesses on one side and households on the other side and households making the uh, goods and service, uh, the um, resources flow from households to businesses and the goods and services flow from businesses back to households. And I told you it was gonna get complicated. Man, it got complicated, didn't it? If you really look at it, it's not so bad. It's really fairly self-explanatory, but you're not gonna be tested over this detail of the circular flow model. For what was on our test right now, you, you could refer just to what was in chapter two. Okay, so we learned how to calculate GDP by the expenditures approach and by the income approach. When we calculated GDP, we calculated it as the monetary value of all those final goods and services with that year's prices. So that's called nominal GDP because it's calculated in the year's prices that that GDP was produced. But if we're gonna compare GDP from 1950 to 1960 to 70 to 80 to 90 to 2000 to 2020 to 2030, 40, 50 in the future, if we're gonna compare GDP over time periods, we have to have a way to hold the dollar value constant, to hold prices constant. Because what we're really looking for is how much change was there in the amount, the quantity of GDP produced, not how much change was there in inflation or the dollar value. 
So nominal GDP is based on the prices that prevailed when the output was produced. So in, um, gee, I don't know, 1970, perhaps a gallon of gasoline cost, I don't know, maybe 50 cents a gallon. I should look that up before I start recording, but I didn't. And a gallon of gasoline in 2020 is, this is difficult too, maybe, I don't know, average in 2020, was it $1.80? I don't know exactly. If we went back a few years, we'd see gas that was at $3. So the prices fluctuate, right? G nominal GDP is whatever the price was in that year that that GDP was calculated. But real GDP is holding prices constant to some base year. So it is a way, real GDP is a way to make all the prices what the base year price was so that we can just look at the changes in output, the changes in quantity, and not the changes in price. This formula, the specific year price goes on top, the base year price goes on bottom, and this particular year, year one, that's the base year, the specific year. So this is our chance to practice the stuff that we just learned. We're going to have all of our information here for an economy for five years. This is a very basic economy. So they just produce one good. They produce pizza. And so the first column is just year one, two, three, four, five. The second column that's actually labeled as column one, units of output, says that in year one, this economy produced five units of output. In year two, they made seven. In year three, made made eight. And in year four, they made 10. In year five, they made 11. That's how the quantity, the number of pizzas they produce. The second labeled column, this price, is how much they sold these pizzas for. For in year one, they made five pizzas and the price of it was $10. In year two, they made seven pizzas and the price was $20. In year three, the price was $25. Year four, 30. Year five, 28. So this next column, we're gonna calculate the price index. Do you remember that the price index was the specific year price? Let's see if I can do this. Specific, okay. So the specific year price divided by the base year price. I am writing with my cursor, not very good. Okay, all right, and then notice that the slide tells us that the base year price, the base year is year one. So year one is our base year. Okay, so what is the price in year one? Well, the price was $10. So the bottom number in this fraction is gonna be $10 because that's the base year price, okay? The base year price was this $10. Okay, so calculating price index. Specific year divided by the base year. In year one, the specific year price is 10. The base year price is 10. 10 divided by 10 is one. One times 100 is 100. So remember, if we're calculating the price index, we were multiplying times 100. This was on that previous slide. Fantastic. Okay, so let's calculate the price index in year two. So in year two, the specific year price is 20 but the base year price was 10. So in year two, we've got 20 divided by 10, which is two times 100, which is 200. So that's the price index in year two. So in year three, the price is 25 divided by the base year price of 10, 25 divided by 10, 2.5 times 100 is the 250. So how about calculating for me what you think the price index is in year three? Uh-huh, so 30 divided by 10 is three times 100. So this one is 300. Ooh, that's really bad. Can you imagine that's a three? There we go. There's probably an eraser somewhere. 
Okay, so let's do your five. Here, let me see if I can make that any better. That's a three. Y'all just gonna have to believe me. All right, so in year five, the specific year price was 28. The base year price is 10. 28 divided by 10 is 2.8. And 2.8 times 100, what's the price index in year five? Everybody together says 280. Good job. All right, so we have the price index. Then we calculate the nominal GDP, and they're telling you how to do that right here. Column one times column two. So column one is units of output, column two is price, and so it's just multiplying across. So in year one, we made five, we charged 10, five times 10 is 50. In year two, we made seven of them, we charged $20 a piece, seven times 20 is 140. In year three, we made eight of them, at a price of $20, $25 a piece, eight times 25 is 200. So what's the nominal GDP in year four? Everybody's thinking, we made 10 of them, we charged $30 a pizza, 10 times 300, that's that 300. Wonder if I can do that better this time. 300, good job. Okay, what's the nominal GDP in year five? Well, we made 11 of them, and we charge $28 a piece, 11 times 28. Everybody got it? It's 308. Fantastic. Okay, so now we need to use the formula that was on that prior page to calculate real GDP. So remember, the formula was nominal GDP <laughs> I hope you have a sense of humor as I'm trying to make this work. Good. Nominal GDP divided by, it was divided by the price index, but not just the price index. What was different about it? It was divided by the price index in hundreds. I have no idea how I'm gonna write that in that tiny little space. I'm just gonna abbreviate something here and hope that you'll remember. Okay, in hundreds. Okay, so <laughs> nominal GDP divided by the price index in hundreds. That means take all of these price index and divide them by 100. So 100 divided by 100 is one. And so 50, nominal GDP of 50 divided by one is 50. So the nominal GDP, or the price index in year two was 200, 200 divided by 100 is two. So the nominal GDP would be 140 divided by two is 70. So in year three, the price index was 250 divided by 100 is 2.5. So 200 divided by 2.5 is 80. So then calculate the real GDP in year four. Well, the nominal GDP was 300 divided by the price index in hundreds. So 300 divided by 100 is 100. Let me try that again. 300 divided by 100 is three, good. So 300 divided by three, that would be our 100. If I can find my dot, there we go. Yay. All right, do it for year five. The price index is 280 divided by 100 is 2.8. Our nominal GDP is 308. 308 divided by 2.8 is 110. Now, I don't wanna confuse anybody but there was an easier way to work this problem to get the real GDP because we had the base year prices. You don't always have the base year price, but we did. So there was an easier way to work this. We could have taken the quantity that was produced in year four and multiplied it times the price of year one. So 10 times 10 would have given us our real GDP in year four of 100. 10 times 10 is 100. And in year five, we made 11. And 
the, times the base year price, 11 times 10 would have been our 110. I don't teach that way because you don't always have the base year price to do this. Sometimes you just have the nominal GDP and the price index. So we needed to know how to do it that way in case we didn't have the base year price. Okay, so here's the slide that's just going to give you those steps to remind you how to do that. Here's another chart where you can practice filling in the gaps from what we've already learned. So remember, to get real GDP, it's nominal divided by the price index in hundreds, right? So here's our price index given us um, in year 2000 is 81.9. So you're gonna take that nominal GDP of 10,289.7 and divide it by 81.9 divided by 100. So move the decimal two places to the left. So 10,289.7 divided by 0.819. And that will give you the real GDP or 14, in 2009, 14,470.9 divided by, move the decimal two places to the left, it's gonna be divided by one. So we know because this um, price index was 100 in year 2009, that that is our base year. And sure enough, it tells us that under number four price, GDP price index, 2009 equals 100, means that that is our base year. Okay, so we're through calculating and we're just gonna talk for a second. So I told you that we use the calculations of GDP to compare if our, our economy from year to year to year to see if the economy is growing or if it's shrinking, but also to compare from one country to another. So as we're looking at GDPs of the United States versus Mexico versus China versus any other country that you want to look at, we need to think about some shortcomings of GDP. Meaning there might be some things that aren't counted or reflected in GDP that might not be a good indication for how the economy is doing. Non-market activities are the kinds of things that we do for ourselves that there is no payment generated for, so it doesn't get counted in GDP. For instance, if I change the oil in my own car, that's never gonna get counted in GDP. But if I take my place to an oil change place, then I pay them for that and that will get counted in GDP. If I keep my own kids at home, then I don't get paid for that. That's not counted in GDP. But if I take my kids to a daycare center, I pay them for caring for the children and so that does get counted in GDP. If I clean my own house, it doesn't get counted. If I bring somebody in and pay her to do it, them to do it, then it does get counted in GDP. So different countries have different norms for what they do for themselves versus what they pay someone else to do. Leisure, that's a really interesting, interesting one. So would you want to live in a country that perhaps had a social norm of more weeks of vacation a year than we have in the United States. The typical average worker in the United States gets two weeks of vacation a year, but the typical average worker in Germany gets six weeks of vacation a year. Would you work for less income if you could have six weeks of vacation instead of two a year? Some people say yes, some people have no, but it depends on your own um, your own sense of well-being, which one of those would make you happier? GDP doesn't consider product quality. It just adds up the dollar value of everything that's produced. We can say, well, the United States produces better quality products than country X or whatever, or country X better, produces better quality. Well, GDP doesn't count that. It's just counting the dollar value of everything produced. The underground economy. So the underground implies that it's secret, so the income is not being reported. So any income that's not reported is obviously not counted in GDP. So you think, most people think when they think underground, they think illegal things like drug trafficking. Okay, so 
whatever drugs that are sold, the illegal drugs, underground drug trafficking, is not going to get counted in GDP. So a country, let's say, uh, oh, I don't know, I don't want to accuse any countries of having a high drug trafficking uh, number, but I don't know, Bolivia came to mind. And if that's true, and I, I really I don't have any way of proving that, it's underground, it's not counted. So we can guess, but we can't really know. Their GDP may be really much larger than it appears because we're not actually calculating those dollars generated by the drug trafficking. But it doesn't have to be something nefarious. It could be just normal stuff like, um, have you ever been wait staff anywhere, a server anywhere, and you a lot of your income was dependent on tips? Did you report all your tips? Because if you reported them, they got counted in GDP. But if you didn't report your tips as income, then that's part of the underground economy. It's not that you were doing something wrong in the actual service that you were providing that you were being tipped for, but because you didn't report it, that's the part of the underground economy. Perhaps GDP is much larger if everyone in every industry that earned tips was actually reporting them. GDP doesn't care about the uh, damage done to the environment. So some countries might be very envir environmentally conscious and other countries not. And so you might want to live in the country that was higher income, but that might be the country that's not environmentally conscious and doesn't count what effect all this production of GDP is having on the environment. Composition, distribution of output. When we're calculating GDP, it doesn't matter if we're producing war goods, some sort of guns, or, or if we're producing um, haircuts and houses. It, GDP doesn't care what you're producing, it's just counting all of it. You might prefer we produce less war goods, but GDP doesn't take that into consideration. It also doesn't take into consideration who gets the goods and services, the distribution of the output. And then, of course, there's a lot of non-economic sources of well-being in one country to another. Uh, other countries have had paternity leave for years, and the United States is just now thinking about doing paternity leave. So before we decide that we'd rather live in one country or another just based on the amount of income that country was producing per person, we might think about these shortcomings of GDP. Just a perspective of the underground economy. So Thailand, Nigeria, you know, large underground economies. It's anticipated that the United States is smaller but again, this is underground, so it's very difficult to calculate. We don't talk much about gross output, so I'm not going to concentrate on that. This is more to do with those shortcomings of GDP and not accounting for quality improvements or more internet products that are free of charge. I mean, how many games do you play that aren't counted in GDP anywhere because they're free? So I hope you enjoyed the getting this um, perspective on how to calculate the wealth of our nation. I would like for you to consider Googling real GDP, and you can put some year in, um, go back a year or two from the current date, real GDP and a date, and then a country name. Do it for the United States, see what ours is. And then do it for a couple of other countries that you're interested in and compare that. You know we can calculate GDP by the income approach, so it's not an exact science. But if you do real GDP per capita, that means the GDP numbers divided by the population. So Google real GDP per capita and then that year, whatever year you decided to put in and compare, then you get a number that kind of shows you the average income per person, per every man, woman, and child from country to country. And it, it's, it's very enlightening when you look at Mexico's real GDP per capita versus the United States versus China versus Qatar. Look up Qatar, Q-A-T-A-R or the UAE, some of those countries, see what those numbers are and then compare to the United States. It's very enlightening. I hope you'll have a good time doing that.